A jihadi who was just convicted of multiple terrorism-related crimes in the UK referred to me as a hardcore enemy of Allah, but praised me for my accuracy in my videos about jihad. Let's see what my number one jihadi fan has to say about me. First, a little background. The BBC reports. A man, too bad there's not a more specific term for this man, better watch out for those men, they keep planning all these killing sprees. A man has been convicted of planning a terror attack at London tourist hotspots just over a year after he was cleared of attacking police with a sword outside Buckingham Palace. Mohio Sunith Chowdhury, 28, from Luton, spoke about targeting attractions, including Madame Tussauds, the Gay Pride Parade, and a tourist bus. The former Uber driver unwittingly revealed his plot to undercover police. He also bragged to them that he had deceived the jury at his first trial. Chowdhury was cleared of a terror charge in December 2018 after slashing police with a sword outside the Queen's London residence while shouting Allahu Akbar. At the time, Chowdhury told jurors he only wanted to be killed by police and did not intend to harm anyone. Think about how amazing the British legal system is. This guy rammed through police barriers with his car, then attacked police with a sword while screaming Allahu Akbar. When he went to trial, he told the jury that he was only trying to commit what's called suicide by cop, and they acquitted him. Here in the U.S., we think about Sherlock Holmes and Father Brown and Miss Marple, and we assume that criminals are in trouble in the U.K., we keep forgetting that all great British detectives are fictional characters and that the real detectives apparently have to catch criminals doing the same thing over and over again before the charges will ever stick. Real British detectives and prosecutors and judges are about as effective as British journalists. Back to some British journalism. Undercover officers posing as like-minded extremists had Chowdhury under surveillance during a five-month operation, his trial at Woolwich Crown Court heard. The chicken shop worker prepared for his atrocity by lifting weights, practicing stabbing and rehearsing beheading techniques, as well as booking shooting range training and trying to acquire a real gun, the court heard. He remained emotionless as jurors found him guilty of engaging in conduct in preparation of terrorist acts, collecting information likely to be useful to someone preparing an act of terrorism, and disseminating terrorist publications. The second charge related to a document titled Guidance for Doing Just Terror Operations on his phone, which included instructions on how to kill people with knives. I'll link to the two articles I'm citing, but in short, this man, for lack of any more descriptive term, immersed himself in the lectures of Anwar al-Awlaki and other jihadi preachers. He watched ISIS execution videos and posted ISIS propaganda. But he eventually decided to see what non-Muslims had to say about jihad. Did non-Muslims understand what Islam says about terrorism? So he got Tommy Robinson's book, Muhammad's Quran, Why Muslims Kill for Islam, and he visited Robert Spencer's website, Jihad Watch, and he watched a bunch of videos by some sexy super genius named David Wood. Let's read the part about what jihadis think of me. The Independent reports. He also relied on videos by a Christian preacher who claimed to explain jihad and vehicle attacks by presenting Islam as inherently violent. How could anyone claim that Islam is inherently violent just because Allah commands his followers to fight anyone who doesn't believe in him? And just because Muhammad said that he had been sent to fight people until they acknowledge him as a prophet? And just because Muhammad ordered his followers to execute anyone who leaves his religion. What kind of monster would claim that Islam is inherently violent simply because it calls for the violent subjugation of the entire world? Chowdhury described American David Wood as a hardcore enemy of Allah. Got that right, Miss Marple. To undercover police, but added, he does a better job of explaining Islam than most speakers in the West. This guy's on a roll. He repeatedly shared Mr. Wood's videos. Mr. Wood's videos? 
Mr. Wood, I didn't spend years earning multiple bachelor's degrees, multiple master's degrees, and a Ph. freaking D in philosophy just to have some second-rate hack for a third-rate garbage tabloid call me Mr. Side note to everyone else, feel free to call me David. I only pull the doctor card on these leftist fish rat propaganda jockeys who keep miscredentialing me. He repeatedly shared Dr. Wood's videos with the officers, instructing them to watch them and describing the passage on vehicle attacks as a really good breakdown of options. I don't mean to toot my own swag horn here, but I have to agree that I did an awesome job explaining a collection of Islamic terrorist attacks in my video, Understanding Vehicular Jihad. Here's the clip Mr. Chowdhury was referring to. Watch carefully, because there's something hilarious in this clip, given how Mr. Chowdhury was apprehended. When all three features are combined, when a person believes in Islam, knows what Islam commands about jihad, and has the requisite personality type, we get a jihadi. But when a jihadi is born, he's faced with a number of options. The world is very different from what it was 14 centuries ago when Allah and Muhammad commanded Muslims to wage jihad, and jihad took on a number of forms even in 7th century Arabia. So there are a range of options available to the newborn jihadi. But what are the main options? Well, first, if the jihadi has always wanted to travel and see the world, he can join a foreign terrorist group. If he decides to go this route, he's faced with a further decision, namely, which group do I join? Do I join Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Al-Shabaab or the Taliban or some other group? Second, the jihadi might decide to wage jihad in his own country. And here, he'll face the further decision of how to go about this. Do I learn to build bombs, or try to get a bomb from someone else, or get some guns or knives, or get in a car or truck and drive it into a crowd of people? Now, the options open to the domestic jihadi vary in two important ways. One, they vary in the amount of preparation required, and two, they vary in the degree of impact. In other words, learning to build bombs can take a significant amount of time, years, if you're thinking of something beyond a pressure cooker or a pipe bomb. But the results can be pretty terrifying if you manage to blow up a bunch of people. Guns may be more or less difficult to acquire depending on where you live and who you know, and the impact may be more or less potent depending on how quickly someone's going to shoot back. Grabbing some knives from your kitchen drawer is simple enough, but the outcome probably won't be particularly devastating. You can only stab or slash so many people before you're shot or tackled. Or you can get in an SUV or something larger and drive it into a crowd of people. Notice that the vehicular option doesn't take much preparation, and that you can potentially inflict a lot of casualties so long as you have a heavy enough vehicle and a sizable crowd of people. So, if you're weighing your options, and you don't think you'd be a good bomb maker, and you think you'll have a tough time getting a gun, and you want to do something more than just stab a few people, vehicular jihad is going to catch your eye. Another option. For people who don't want to die, there's the option of supporting jihad financially. Muhammad himself said that people who pay for others to wage jihad receive the same reward as the jihadis who fight. So if you've got a business or a good job, you might decide to fund jihadis. This is why we've seen so many cases of people being charged with sending money or supplies to various terrorist groups. Even groups like CARE have been caught conspiring to fund terrorist groups. Finally, you might believe that you're supposed to wage jihad, but you might not like any of the options currently available, so you might decide to wait patiently. Here you're waiting for something to come along that jumps out at you as a mission from Allah. You're convinced that you're called to fight, but you're not convinced that any of the options currently on the table is the way to go. Hence, you wait. And polls show that many people who agree with jihadi doctrine aren't actually waging jihad. They're waiting. So now we're in a position to understand the rise of vehicular jihad. Years ago, Al-Qaeda set the bar for a successful terrorist attack pretty high. A successful terrorist attack was crashing planes into buildings or blowing up subway stations, mass casualties, go big or go home. 
And for years, aspiring jihadis attempted to recapture the success of the 9-11 attacks or the 7-7 bombings. And they failed. Over and over again, jihadis would get caught trying to buy bombs from undercover FBI agents. They would then go to prison. And instead of inflicting terror, they convinced us that the FBI is really on top of things. Eventually, a few jihadis concluded that successful small-scale attacks would be better than failed large-scale attacks. So instead of plotting to blow up a building, they would grab a knife or an axe or a gun or a small pressure cooker bomb and go stab or hack or shoot or blow up a few people in the name of Allah. These small-scale attacks wouldn't be as dramatic as the 9-11 attacks or the 7-7 bombings, but they were much more difficult to stop than large-scale attacks. But even though small-scale attacks are more difficult to prevent, they're not always impossible to stop. Police can keep an eye on people who buy guns or who download instructions to build pressure cooker bombs. If someone's carrying a backpack onto a train, police can tell him to open his bag. But how do you stop someone from getting in his SUV and driving it into a crowd of people? Until he's plowing through the people, he hasn't done anything. How do you stop someone from renting a U-Haul truck and heading towards a local parade? You can't. And jihadis are now recognizing that for those of them who don't want to join a foreign terrorist group and don't want to support jihad financially and don't want to wait indefinitely and don't have access to bombs or guns and would like to do something more spectacular than stab someone, the best rewards to risk ratio is vehicular jihad. Extremely low risk of getting caught before the attack, very high rewards in terms of terror, casualties, and injuries. It took jihadis a while to realize this, but after a few successful attacks, they've caught on. So good. Thanks for plugging it for me, Independent. The link to the full video is in the description box. By the way, did you catch the part where I pointed out that jihadis keep getting caught because they keep going to undercover FBI agents? Over and over again, jihadis would get caught trying to buy bombs from undercover FBI agents. They would then go to prison. And instead of inflicting terror, they convinced us that the FBI is really on top of things. Maybe Mr. Chowdhury should have paid closer attention to my videos since he kept sharing them with undercover agents. In Telegram chats, Chowdhury claimed that despite mocking Islam, Dr. Wood was more truthful than the majority of Islamic speakers. You heard it here, folks. David Wood is more truthful than the majority of Islamic speakers. He told the jury, so he was still talking about my videos at his trial. Those must be some good videos. He told the jury that he found the videos while looking for the truth of religious doctrine, adding, Dr. Wood uses the references, I sure do, and proves this is the truth about Islam. Absolutely correct. It's taboo. It's like forbidden knowledge. Wow, wow, wow. So, this jihadi spent years listening to the lectures of Muslim preachers like Sheikh Anwar al-Awlaki. Then he decided to get a second opinion on what Islam teaches. So he went to Tommy Robinson and Robert Spencer and yours truly. And he stumbled upon the tautology of the century. Islam teaches what it teaches. Why do jihadis agree with me on the true teachings of Islam? It's because we're reading the same sources. And unlike politicians and journalists and educators and entertainers, we refuse to reinterpret them. Ask a jihadi, what does Allah mean when he orders his followers to fight those who don't believe in him? The jihadi will answer. He means fight those who don't believe in him. Ask me or Robert Spencer, what does Allah mean when he orders his followers to fight those who don't believe in him? We will answer. He means fight those who don't believe in him. Ask an American or a European politician or journalist, what does Allah mean when he orders his followers to fight those who don't believe in him? 
The politician or journalist will answer, Oh, he means that Muslims are only allowed to fight in self-defense. Well, why didn't he say that? Why did he say, fight those who do not believe, if he really meant, only fight in self-defense? Oh, it's because, um, er, context. Bull. We can go through the literary context and the historical context. The verse means exactly what it says. So, why did Allah say, fight those who do not believe in Allah and demonstrate via the literary and historical contexts that he means exactly what he says if he really meant something completely different? Oh, it's because, um, er, you're a racist and a bigot and an Islamophobe. Welcome to Fantasyland. But David, wouldn't it be better if you lied about what Islam teaches and just kept telling people that Islam is a religion of peace? Not remotely. People like Moyo Sunath Chowdhury are always going to find out that Islam commands them to wage jihad. If the rest of us lie about Islam, it's the rest of the world that will remain in a state of ignorance, not jihadis. And the greatest asset of the global jihad, with the possible exception of political correctness, is ignorance. So, when Allah and Muhammad call for the violent subjugation of the entire world, believe them. When jihadis tell you that they've been commanded to violently subjugate the entire world, believe them. When a bunch of deluded morons who wouldn't know the Quran from a phone book tell you that Islam is all about peace and tolerance, don't believe them because they're deluded morons. Well, now that you know that my videos about jihad have the jihadi stamp of approval, how about watching a few of them and becoming part of the solution? I recommend starting with the three stages of jihad, then moving on to the much shorter Jihad Triangle, followed by Understanding Vehicular Jihad, and finally, The Quran in Context. The links are in the description box, and there's plenty more where those came from.